Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Joint Astronomical Colloquium in Heidelberg. And today we are really particularly honored to welcome Professor Roger Blanford of the Cavalier Institute for Particle Physics and Cosmology, who has been and definitely continues to be instrumental in the development of the theoretical framework describing many processes in high energy astrophysics, which have been discovered over the last 50 years. And I invite uh, Roger's host, Brian Reville, to go deeper into that and make the formal introduction. Okay, uh, uh, thanks Richard. Um, so, uh, as you said, it, it really is a tremendous pleasure today um, for me and I think for all of us uh, to have our, our colloquium speaker, Professor Roger Blanford. Um, Roger, is the Luke Blossom Professor in the School of Humanities and Sciences at Stanford University. Um, and of course, amongst his many accolades, he's both a member of the American National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the Royal Society um, in honor of his vital contributions to modern astrophysics. Um, so Roger began his astrophysics career at Cambridge in the 1970s, completing his PhD work alongside um, Martin Rees. And while a fellow at Cambridge, Roger, together with Roman Znajek proposed uh, the process by which energy can be extracted electromagnetically from a rotating black hole, um, what we now call the Blanford Znajek mechanism. Um, subsequently moved across the Atlantic to join the faculty at Caltech, uh, where he held the Chase Tolman Professorship of Theoretical Astrophysics, incidentally the chair that was also held by Richard Feynman. Um, while there, he further developed his ideas on jet launching and emission, um, together with colleagues such as David Payne and Ariel Conigal. Um, and he derived the self-similar relativistic blast wave solutions that lay the foundations for GRB afterglow theory, again, together with Chris McKee. Um, and uh, one of my favorites in 1978 publication together with Jeremiah O'Stryker, uh, he was one half of one of the four groups that independently put forward the diffusive shock acceleration theory, which is the basis for a non-thermal emission from countless astrophysical sources and still the best explanation for cosmic ray origins in our galaxy. Um, around the turn of the millennium, uh, Roger moved to Stanford University, where he assumed the Pehong and Adel Chen professorship or directorship of the Kavli Institute of Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology, and he was division head from 2005 to 2013. Um, Roger is a renowned inspirational lecturer. He has authored and co-authored several seminal review papers um, and recently published a comprehensive graduate level textbook on classical physics uh, with his Caltech colleague, Kip Thorne. I have my, my copy here. Um, um, he has received numerous prizes and awards throughout his career, including uh, the Eddington Medal, the Crawford Prize, and, and very recently the Shaw Prize. I think Roger continues to maintain active involvement in, in cutting edge developments in, in high energy astrophysics, his involvement in Fermi, the Event Horizon, Horizon Telescope, Cherenkov Telescope Array, um, and even a global pandemic seems to have little effect on his scientific pace. Um, so without further ado, I hand the uh, virtual floor over to our esteemed speaker who will tell us about one of the most remarkable recent observations and their implications. Thank you, Roger. Well, thank you very much, Richard and Brian, for your kind and very generous introduction. I'm very delighted and honored to be with all of you, um, regretting, as we all do, that this is not in person but over Zoom but this too shall pass. And uh, I look forward to returning to Heidelberg in person, I hope before too long. Um, I was going to give a talk today about, as Brian mentioned, black holes and their role in astrophysics. I'm going to specialize it um, to, uh, to some extent to applications to the recent remarkable Event Horizon Telescope observations. Um, <clears throat> but I think what I have to say, at least in my head, is um, more general than that. But I'll, but as I say, I'll try and focus it and particularize it to the to, to MED7. Um, on the way, as I hope you can see on my title slide, I have a large, long list of people to, um, to thank, and I do this, uh, but you should blame none of them for anything that might be um, uh, heretical or uh, just plain wrong in what goes, uh, what, what comes next. But it, it, it is, 
I've had many very good collaborators and I would like to acknowledge them. And I'll, I will do that in, in fact, along the way. Um, so let, let's just go, um, let me just go on to the next slide. Okay, well, just by the way of context, of course, black holes, which are all, already a big deal in astrophysics have become even more famous with the award of two Nobel prizes. Um, my, all of these are my colleagues, so I know quite well. And on the left was uh, for gravitational radiation from, from LIGO and Virgo, uh, ultimately Virgo. And then on, uh, on the right was Roger Penrose, uh, and, uh, 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 Andrea Reinhardt, uh, who know for their remarkable work, uh, both theoretical and observational. Um, I must admit, when I saw these pictures here, well, I saw that picture, of course, and then when I saw that one, uh, my first reaction, I was totally thrilled by this because they're my colleagues who I, uh, and friends who I admire greatly. Uh, but then I came to the conclusion that maybe black holes have hair after all. So that was my reaction. But anyway, more scientifically, black holes are in the, um, have been in the news because very much their association with gamma ray bursts, uh, with cosmic rays, which I won't have time to discuss, but it, it's certainly been then one of the uh, culprits for the high ultra high energy cosmic rays, for uh, the very high energy gamma rays, which are being almost at the PV energies, which are being reported now, particularly from the Chinese de detectors. And then the neutrinos, which are seen particularly um, uh, uh, in the Antarctic um, uh, from Ice Cube. Um, so it's very much in, in the air. And so the, the M87 um, uh, observations, which were reported uh, uh, two years ago, um, they are. Um, they were remarkable. They were taking VLBI to a new level. And this was a remarkable accomplishment, as I say, by a large international team. And European radio astronomers were a large part of this. And, you know, again, I was um, thrilled when I saw, saw this image and for the first time. And um, when, I, when it first became public, I, I showed it to one of my collaborators, who you, I'll mention later, but you already heard from her talking about a rather different topic. Um, uh, uh, getting homo chirality from cosmic rays, and I and I sent it to Noemi Globus, and um, uh, and she sent this back immediately. She said it's all all a cover up, all a great big government hoax. This is what they're actually looking at, and you can see a cartoon on on the right hand side. Um, any rate. So let's, let's specialize down to M87. This, of course, is one of the most famous um, extragalactic objects, and it's uh, seen throughout the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, just to give a very quick crazy of a huge amount that's known about it, it's an elliptical galaxy in a nearby cluster. It's very massive. It's got a central black hole, which, well, Sergeant shown here and um, uh, Peter Young in, and others in 1978 measured uh, a mass of 5 billion solar masses, and that's pretty close to the contemporary view. Um, it's seen on very many different angular scales. It has a famous jet, the first one ever discovered by Heber Curtis, also shown here, and in over a century ago. And it's, there's now good evidence that the, the, this jet, a, a sort of prototypical example of many of them, the relativistic jets, originates near the black hole. It's actually the means for heating and keeping a little socially distant the cluster gas that is, would otherwise be crashing into the galaxy. Um, and the observations, as you can see, particularly at radio wavelengths, have told us a lot about what is actually going on physically in these jets and ruled out many otherwise reasonable possibilities. Um, what the, the feature that I think is important, and I will come back to this, is if you look at the images here on, on the right-hand side, getting to smaller and smaller scale, you'll see evidence for the, most of the emission close to the black hole coming from a sort of boundary layer, a sheath, if you like, there are many words for it. And the other thing I just sort of emphasize is that the, this, this, we, there's good evidence from Craig Walker and others that we're looking at this jet at a modestly small angle, about 17 degrees is the nominal value. And I'll assume that it's not actually pretty, if that is horribly wrong, what I have to say is not, 
it's changed some, but not a lot, but that's what I'll assume. Okay, <clears throat> moving on, of course, jets themselves are seen um, in many different guises. And top left is the meerkat observations um, of the whole sky. So there's probably a billion jets that are, can be counted on the sky at the moment. Um, and then there's the Crab Nebula, which is, despite being a spinning magnetized neutron star, makes a pair of jets. Uh, protostellar jets get in on the act, famous HL Tau, SS433. Again, something one's learning a lot about now, actually, is a gamma ray source, and high energy gamma ray source. Uh, neutrinos getting in on the act. Uh, this is the putative detect uh, association. I mean, careful my words here. With a with a blazar of a, a PUV neutrino, actually more than one, and <clears throat> this is all not completely confirmed yet, but certainly it's a reasonable proposition and one that's being actively explored that these jets make high energy neutrinos, and then there's gamma ray bursts, um, which after much uh, much frustration, I think, for the radio astronomers, gloriously show jets after about 50 days of observation. So here's one case. And so all of them are in a way, two recent observations. This is a space VLBI from Radio, uh, radio Astron. This is again showing a jet in Perseus A384. Again, you see the boundary layer and the black thing at the top is the location of the black hole. And then even more spectacularly from the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration themselves, you see the Sene jets, again, one seeing these boundary layers and the black hole is sort of located, is located about here. And um, again, I'll return to that point. So go to the HT observations. It's a huge team. I've just shown, shown bug shots of three of my uh, collaborators um, who I work with on, on, on these and other topics in, in the past, and they're members of the team, which I'm certainly not, but I sort of admire all they they do, and they've been very much associated with a um, with a, 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 an interpretation that I'm going to modif try and modify a little bit. Okay, so I said the modern view is about six, six or seven solar masses, a billion solar masses for the black hole, um, and I'm not going to go through what the EHT team actually did, and I suspect you've heard more than one talk on that. But the the bottom line is that they believe that there is a ring of gas around her. It's emitting synchrotron radiation at 1.3 millimeters involving modestly re relativistic electrons and fields in the range of 10 to 100 Gauss. And polarization has been measured more recently. And there's circular polarization and linear polarization. And although more needs to be done, this is already starting to be rather diagnostic. <clears throat> so I'm going to look at this a little bit more as a phenomenologist, if you like, and give you some numbers on M87. And as I said, six to seven billion solar mass black hole, that means about 10 to the 15 centimeters gravitational radius, GM over C squared. Um, I'm going to guess for these purposes, uh, and you know, there's reason for believing this, a modestly spinning black hole, A equals 0.9 relative to the maximum value of one. The A is a measure of the angular momentum. As I said, in this, as a parameter, it has a value, maximum value of one, and 0.9 looks like it's close to maximal, but if you think about it a tiny bit, it's more or less half maximal because angular velocity is really what counts, not angular momentum. So this is a, a modestly rapidly spinning black hole, and it's not unreasonable. The, um, at the, the characteristic time scale for a period is seven days, and the total energy in this is two times 10 to the 63 Ergs, which is good to keep the Virgo cluster warm and toasty for, 10, for a trillion years. Um, now, now, I'm going to make some comparisons here. Um, the jets, these famous jets, we don't measure directly what power they carry, but reasonable astrophysical inferences give a range of values between 10 to the 43 to 10 to the 44 Ergs per second. And I'll take an intermediate combined power carried by the jets of 10 to the 43 Ergs per second. And my, I think my central observation here is that this is something like 600 times the power that's seen radiatively from the ring. So we have this ring there and it is, and the jets are carrying away much more power, I contend, than, what's in, than what we see from the ring. 
And even if we take in a putative accretion disk going out to the Bondi radius, it's, we put up a limit throughout the whole electromagnetic spectrum. And it's only about, it's less than 1% of the power that it seems like the jets are carrying. And, uh, and so for me, the question has been from the very moment which I saw these, these, these images is why is the ring so dim? Not the fact that they saw it, but why isn't it brighter? Because these jets, although not big by quasar standards, are still pretty powerful compared with what they're looking at. Um, another op observation is that if you make a sort of independent assessment of how much mass is actually crashing into the center of the galaxy, much less than um, is involved in the whole cluster, it's only a tiny bit of it, it, it would be about 10 to the 25 grams per second. And this, and uh, so and that is equivalent to, if that were to radiate at 10 to the 20 ergs per gram, it'd be 10 to the 45 ergs per second, again, orders of magnitude larger than what you're actually seeing. So a big puzzle for me is if you accept these numbers, is that where, where does the mass go? Uh, does it all go down the black hole invisibly or not? I already mentioned the inclination. So let me just say that um, these numbers, I think, are all contestable. But um, and the Event Horizon Telescope as a collaboration adopts uh, more, smaller numbers for many of these things. And they may turn out to be right. Um, and this is a misinterpretation. But I think the principles I'm espousing based on these numbers still stand. OK, so I've, I've given some of these concerns already. Why is the ring so dim relative to the jet? Um, and why is it so dim relative to the mass supply? I've already mentioned that. It seems, you know, it seems naively to have an extraordinary low radiative efficiency, and yet we we have got a ring of gas that's trans relativistic, trans alphanic, transonic, and so on, and, and yet it's it's failing to radiate when under much more gentle conditions, astrophysical plasma radiates extraordinarily efficiently. <clears throat> so the pressure in the in the emitting electrons is is very small. Um, you, you give a very simple argument based on the cooling times that that if you took somewhat pejoratively here, if you took a, a, a maximal magnetic field strength of about 100 Gauss, the pressure in the electrons you're actually observing is 10 to the minus seven of that. That's another way of saying it's radiatively very efficient. This this inefficient this ring it seems to be another question that of course is very important and we can now thanks to these glorious vlbi measurements on many scales start to address in a very serious way is how is the jet actually made what is these all these jets that we see how they collimate it another question is why does the ring vary so much it in fact is very it appears to be variable just from the VLB observations on time scales much shorter than the period of rotation of the ring, perhaps a few percent of that. So it has to be internally very variable and changing. And and then the from the polarization observations, there are you know there have been many models made that account for this, but the naive view is that the magnetic field uh, is vertical when you might, if it's a ring, you might expect it to be sheared out in the azimuthal in the toroidal direction. So um, no, no, I, I'm not sort of trying to set up a fight here because a huge amount of work has been done by the EHT uh, team on making lots of models, which they fit the visibility data and so on. And they address all of these points. It isn't where they're unaware of them. But I think the fact that these sort of sticking out points here is that they do motivate thinking about some alternatives to the type of models that they've been considering. Now a very, somehow or other, uh, okay, um, the, the, the pictures here are, are of um, uh, Roy Kerr, Roger Penrose again, and uh, Stephen Hawking, but they seem to have slipped off this slide, but never mind. Um, the, just a very quick precy of what I need about astrophysical black holes. So um, we observe them as in the stellar form, three to 150 solar masses, in the masses form from a million to 10 billion solar masses, typically. Um, there are others that may be there as well. I won't get, get involved with that here. Um, black holes as theoretical objects are fully described by mass and spin. They're astrophysically, their charges, for good reason, assume to be zero. 
not for applied mathematicians, but for certainly for astrophysics, I think, and so they're even simpler than the electrons. Um, uh, these mass and the spin can be measured as a thought experiment by planets and gyros and so on. Mass, of course, is a scale of length, time, energy, and so on and so forth. And the spin, as I mentioned, is described by this parameter A. Now, this, most black holes are expected to be spinning, and that, that changes the geometry some, changes the astrophysics a little bit, gives the black hole an angular velocity and an area which must increase, a theorem due to Stephen Hawking. Classically, I mean that. And there's a rotational energy, and this is terribly important, it's up, up to 29%, but typically for the sort of models I'd be considering here between 5 and 10% of the rest mass, is a rest mass energy that, like in a pulsar, is there for the taking. Spinning black holes, um, as Roger Penrose pointed out, and uh, another, sorry, not just Penrose, but the, uh, sorry, several relatives point out in 69, have a, a region called the ergosphere, which observers must rotate with the black hole. And inside this region, as Roger did point out, uh, there's negative energy orbits that are confined to the ergosphere. And if you put a, if you contrive to put a rock on a negative energy orbit and let it cross the horizon, you will have removed that spin energy. That's a thought experiment. And we now think we can do the same sort of thing using magnetic field. So that's the um, the sort of astro the, the, the sort of theoretical physics, if you like, of, of black holes, but to an astronomer. They're sort of less curious about all these wonderful physics questions that you can ask about it. They like to sit in the audience and watch the show. And uh, that's, I'm going to take more or less that phenomenological stance rather than get involved in the theoretical physics, if you like, of, of black holes in this form. Now, another little bit just didactic here. Um, and this is my colleague, colleague David Payne. Um, top right hand corner and say a little bit about if you think about magnetohydrodynamics this of course is a description of magnetized plasma there's two important principles one that i like to call in the language of pop psychology go with the flow and this basically means the magnetic fields move with conducting plasma the other in the same with a phrase taken from the same uh, discipline called push pull which is that the stress tensor unlike gas stress is, is, uh, is anisotropic and, and decomposes into a pressure and a tension that pulls along the magnetic field. And that'll be very important. Um, it's rather like the cosmic, for those who care about a, a, an aside, it's rather like the cosmological constant that can be thought of in, in this language too. Um, now, the, the, typically you get fast alpha and slow waves in, in magnetohydrodynamics, and these, these are features of applications of MHD to astrophysics. But one of the things that they can do is they can launch uh, winds from uh, centrifugally from accretion disks simply by allowing a, a sort of a, 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 a little blob of gas to be flung out centrifugally by this going with the flow magnetic field line shown here in the bottom right hand corner and that a gas can be flung out and then as it's got inertia it causes these magnetic field lines further up here to be wrapped around the jet to provide a tension which can then collimate the jet and that's a sort of general mechanism and I'll invoke this mechanism um, uh, in what follows. So these, I'm basically saying that as far as an accretion disk surrounding the black hole in M87, the contention is not just for me, but for many other people, is that magnetic winds will launch and pinch uh, an outflow. Um, and this acts on the jet and is the agent that's responsible for the active collimation you can see going on in these VLB images. It's not just a question of launching energy along the cone. You've actually got to make the cross-sectional area in terms of angle get smaller and smaller as you go out. And this is the um, conjectured mechanism for doing it. So I said a little bit about the fact that there's rotational power here um, and it can be extracted by magnetic field. Here are some of, again, the top right-hand corner, some of my collaborators, Roman Knight, Dave Meyer, and John, Jonathan McKinney, whose uh, simulation is shown in the bottom right-hand corner. And, um, and the normal view now is that although the magnetic field is, is generally in the case of M87, um, 
uh, confined. Um, it, 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 sorry, the magnetic the magnetic field extracts the end, the power from the jets comes from the spin of the black hole in the way depicted here. The actual jet itself is confined by a thick gaseous accretion disk, and that's the, the normal view. And I'm going to say. Uh, that the black hole spin in the, under these circumstances powers much more than the jets. So um, just to give, um, and I'm not going to go through the sort of detail, the electrodynamics, I will, I will go through that a little bit further down the road, but um, let me just say that that's the picture. I'm going to say that A, the black hole spin uh, powers much more than the jets, and B, the collimation is caused by the disk wind, not by the thick accretion disk, which the EHT folks um, argue is what they're looking at. So uh, I, I call this nature and nurture, and just let me again somewhat didactically summarize a lot of work. Um, uh, uh, and uh, like to highlight, uh, they weren't collaborators of mine, but they are friend, friends of mine, Steve Balbus there on the left hand side, and very sadly, John Hawley, who is a wonderful person passed away recently. And I would like to acknowledge the work that they did. And if we talk about a, a traditional accretion disk, um, uh, think of it as being thin in the sort of classical way. Uh, it is inevitably magnetized. If you try and make it ionized and unmagnetized and on a dynamical time scale, it creates through the so-called magnetic irritational instability, uh, lots of magnetic field and uh, this magnetic field provides a torque within the accretion disk, and this is the key dynamical point, this torque transmits energy outwards, and that allows accretion disks classically to radiate three times the local binding energy release, and all the power for that comes from smaller disk radius. And I'm going to say that it's actually a lot, there's a lot of it in these systems and it's all coming from the spin, ultimately from the spin of the black hole, not from the disk itself. There's an intimate stable circular orbit, uh, which you know about, and the binding energy that can typically be released is competitive with that which is available from the, um, from the spinning black hole. And so this is the sort of traditional view, and I like to call this sort of um, uh, nurture, if you like. This is the feeding and sustenance of the of the black hole by the disk, and so the gravitational power in this case is nurture. Now, non-traditional accretion disks, not the flat ones, but thick ones, and this is in some sense the, you know, one of the bases of the EHT interpretation, is there's two ways um, in which accreting gas may not radiate fast enough. Um, and one is when it's too small an accretion rate, which is what's relevant for M87. The other, which I'll not discuss here, is when there's too much of it, and then radiation pressure, means that the gas under these circumstances may um, make a very thick accretion disk, shown here in, in an old cartoon that Martin Rees, Mitch Beagleman, and Stelfin and I wrote about in the 80s. And basically, this makes a sort of funnel which provides the collimation for the jet. And this is what I'm going to argue against here and provide an alternative. And this is option B, that the disk remains thin, that the power um, uh, for the jet still comes from the spin of the black hole, but it's this thin, this wind from the thin accretion disk uh, that is carrying away energy and angular momentum from the disk. So, um, so the interpretation is one that currently I've been working uh, uh, with uh, Naomi Glover, so I mentioned at the start, and you could call this, um, and here the idea, as I said, is that the M87 powers the black hole spin um, and it's not a not accretion that's doing this the, the whole show is really powered by the black hole spin and this drives away essentially all of the gas that is supplied at large radius and it does this through a wind which collimates the jet and starts it radiating through these boundary layers so in some sense this analogy here is if you like the sun where in the 19th century um, uh, the sun was thought to be pad, we were kept warm by the release of gravitational energy, um, but it, then it was realized that the uh, solar system was many billions of years old, and there wasn't enough gravitational energy, you need a stronger source of power, and that of course was the invented, nuclear physics was invented partly for that purpose, 
And so we now have a very accurate model of the sun that involves a nuclear reactor in the center. And so, you know, schematically what one has here, I'm going to use a few words here, um, is yes, there's a jet and it's powered by a region which I'm going to call an ergomagnetosphere. Um, and this is a magnetized region around the black hole that's more or less devoid of gas. Outside this is an ejection disk, not an accretion disk, but an ejection disk. And the main feature of this disk is that this is where most of the mass that's supplied at large radius is escaping at small radius. And then there's outside that is what I call an in injection disk. We call this an injection disk. And this is where the gas is, is, is added to the disk by infall at at 100, you know, 10 or 100,000 gravitational radii, all the way out to the Bondi radius at a million gravitational radii. So in terms of making simple models and so on, and I don't want to belabor this point, um, uh, taking a sort of global model of the mass flow in the system for all the way from the gravitational radius of the black hole, all the way out to the Bondi radius, which is a million times larger, at large radius, the mass flowing in the accretion disk is building up through infall from the surrounding interstellar medium, if you like, and to cost the medium. And then at, at smaller radius, the, what's characteristic is the mass inflow is decreasing as more and more of the mass is carried away in this hydromagnetic wind that is ultimately collimating the jets. So here's a sort of cartoon, if you like, of the inject injection disk. This is on the large scale out to a Bondi radius shown here. And the notion is that I'm just showing this schematically here in pictures. There's an infall of gas onto the disk. And so the accretion disk is building up in this so-called ejection disk, in injection disk, sorry, excuse me, uh, up to a peak rate of about 10 to the 25 grams per second, which is the full amount of mass that's falling onto the black hole. And we're going to learn a lot, I hope, from James Webb um, about this. And uh, there's a large scale magnetic field here, just like there is with the sun. And the polarity is constant. This is a sort of key point for the larger interpretation is that the magnetic field that one sees around the black hole is a product of the magnetic field on the large scale. And for millions of years and more probably, the magnetic field has a constant for overall polarity. And you can test all this with rotation measure gradients and so on. Again, I'm not going to go through it, make a point about this, but this clearly this has a lot of implications for observations. Now, if we go to smaller radius, we get the ejection disk. And this is, you've got gas that's uh, escaping from the disk all the time. So there's relatively little of its maximum mass accretion flow at, by the time you get down to the black hole. And this, as I emphasize, the whole thing is the whole structure is responsible for the ultimate collimation of the ejection disk of the of the jet, excuse me, which is created from the spin of the black hole. And one way of thinking about this, as well as in terms of magnetic field, it's also very helpful to think about this in terms of electrical current and think about this as a large flow, large scale flow of electrical current, just like you can do with the solar wind. Moving on. We're getting closer in now on the sort of on the scale of the the MHD wind closer to the black hole. We can see just sort of schematically here we've got sort of more elaborate models, but I think the cartoons are probably more useful at this point. Is that there is this wind that leaves powerful collimating wind that leaves the accretion disk with lots of toroidal field, and it interacts with the jet, which is an electromagnetic structure initially but there's a boundary layer or a sheath flow where there's entrainment of gas from the wind. There's lots of dissipation going on there of all for the gratification of uh, BLBI radio astronomers. And, um, and this boundary layer, there are many mechanisms for amplifying the field, the random field, if you like, and causing polarization and particle acceleration in there. Again, I'm not going to belabor that. And let's go, if we go around to even smaller radius, um, there you've got the inner edge of this ejection disk here, and then this region, which we'll call, if you like, an ergomagnetosphere, which is a, an electromagnetic region surrounding the black hole. And it's that ergomagnetosphere that we can, Naomi Globus and I contend, 
is what the um, rate, what the radio EHT crew are actually observing. It's not a, a thick accretion disk. There is a thin accretion disk at larger radius. It's actually this magnetosphere where there's a lot of electromagnetic and particle effects going on, and that's what they're actually observing. Um, and the and this uh, ergo magnetosphere is a place where power and angular momentum from the black hole goes not just up through the jet, but also goes outwards in the equatorial plane and provides an inner boundary condition, if you like, for this ejection disk. And that's the power that is driving away all the gas in this particular interpretation. And obviously, I said, there's a current flow here. And so one can think about a current going outwards in the disk. And then there's a, an inflow current, it turns out, with this polarity along the jets like this quadrupolar. And then there'll be a sort of partial return current, which will be on the edge of the jets. And the interpretation of those boundary layers, in fact, is that you can think about them as dissipating, you know, omically dissipating electrical current as much as you can think about them as um, uh, making um, a, a, as being a fluid dynamical structure, they're really a hydromagnetic structure and it's electrical dissipation that's ultimately responsible for the emission from the jet wall. So I'm not going to have time to go through much of this, but as there's going to be a sort of question and answer session, I, and this will be a bit more for specialists here, uh, we'll have time to, to get into this after the talk. And I gather there's some sort of meet and greet afterwards, which, where again, I'd be able to go delve deep into this. So I'm going to go this through very fast. Um, again, another couple of collaborators of mine, Yaji Yuan and, and, uh, and uh, Wilkins. Um, there are sort of four ways of thinking about electromagnetism classically. One is, is vacuum electrodynamics, which is totally inappropriate here because there's, charge, there's plasma there and there's easy to carry currents and charges. A second way to think about this is um, this is the one that we think is important in the vicinity of the black hole near the ergo magnetosphere. This is force-free electrodynamics where the plasma provides current, but no inertia. And so it's a purely electromagnetic structure, rho E plus J cross B. This is the way that Clark Maxwell thought about electromagnetism. Current was nothing to do with particles. I'm not sure he thought about it as being particles, but he represented it as just a continuous flow, like hydrodynamics without any structure to it. And rho E plus J cross B can vanish. That's, that means it's force free. We haven't got any inertia with the gas. The gas just provides the charge. And another way that this is, that we contend is important for near the black hole in the disk, by contrast, it's MHD, magnetohydrodynamics, where you give the, the gas contributes to the stress energy tensor. It's got a velocity, it's got an Ohm's law. And this is what we think is going on in the ejection and the accretion disk, but not relevant around the black hole. And then the big, one of the big developments, which is sort of very ambitious and has to do it in a rather artificial way, but again, it's a great, great progress, is to try and combine all of this into a plasma physics model rather than an MHD model. And um, Paul Parfrey and others have done great work in developing particle and cell codes to describe this. So there's a lot going on theoretically in this. And just to make it clear here, we're in the regime here where the Lama radius to the size of the system is perhaps 10 to the minus 12. The minimal charge you need relative to the amount of gas you could have there is 10 to the minus 12. And you're likely to get a lot of electron positron pairs and gamma rays and so on from this region. So it's naturally dissipative. And that's what we claim you're actually looking at and so on. So this, I, I'm not going to make, make a, a bigger deal of this. Uh, as I say, this is, this is a description of force-free electrodynamics, which you can work as a purely causal theory under these circumstances. And central to this is the notion that quantum electrodynamics makes all the charge you need easily and at will in here and in other environments, but it doesn't make so much that you have to consider its inertia as important. So let me just stop there. This is a little bit more about think, uh, thinking about um, how you extract energy from the spin of the black hole. I'm not uh, going to go through this in this talk, but I, if, in the question and answers, I may, re, may refer back to this slide, which is sort of a sort of more didactic way of thinking about extracting rotational energy using force-free electrodynamics from a black hole. Um, and just to, just to emphasize sort of qualitatively that what you're doing is you're extracting this 
this energy essentially invisibly. There's no reason for the electromagnetic power that comes out of the black hole to dissipate close to the black hole very or dissipate very efficiently uh, because it's essentially an, an invisible pointing flow. And it isn't until it starts interacting with the, the wind in this model um, that you get the emission that's responsible for the radio images that are seen. There is, of course, serious dissipation in this, um, in this system, but that happens uh, um, uh, politely uh, with true bourgeois sensibility behind the, behind the curtain, behind the, um, behind the event horizon. And so the two places where you get dissipation are invisible dissipation behind the event horizon and remotely in the jet. So that's the sort of overall picture. Now, there is a bit of a problem with this interpretation is that I said that we're viewing this spinning black hole as a power source, not just for the jet, but for driving away the gas from the disk. And the problem was if you go back to some sort of model like this and imagine field lines close to the black hole, they carry energy and angular momentum along upwards along the jet and not outwards. And so there is a problem in that you've got to have a mechanism for carrying energy and angular momentum out radially outwards from the spinning black hole's event horizon all the way out to the um, accretion disk, where it is then going to be carried outwards by uh, viscous torque and responsible for driving away the gas from the disk. So one way in which this may happen is that there's actually an instability for the magnetic field um, uh, as it goes through the, um, the region. I'll, in fact, I'll show a picture of this in a moment. In fact, let me, let, as I'm running a bit out of time, let me go forward to the next slide and just say in words um, what, what, what's envisaged here. And this is a, this is a cartoon, um, no more than that. Here's a spinning black hole. This dotted region here is essentially the ergosphere. That's the region in which an observer has to be rotating along with the black hole. And um, one, one schematic, there's two, there's actually two possibilities here. And what we imagine is happening in practice is a combination of the two. One is you can imagine magnetic field lines that go straight through the equatorial plane. There's not much inertia here. There's very little mass that flow onto the black hole. And you get energy and angular momentum transported outwards by instabilities somewhat similar in spirit to the Balbus Hawley or magneto rotational instability I invoked in the accretion disk. Um, and that transport of energy and angular momentum as say powers the outflow here. And it's basically instabilities, tangling of magnetic field line in this region, in this idealization. We call this a clutch model. It's like an automotive clutch. And the alternative possibility is that there are field lines that actually connect the accretion disk where they're well anchored to the horizon of the black hole where they're not so well anchored. And they, those two can transport energy and angular momentum outwards. And this is sort of an English word that's known to sailors and so on, call this the capstan, uh, capstan version. And the real thing is a time-dependent, non-axisymmetric combination of these two mechanisms is the way we would think about it. But the key dynamical point is that energy and angular momentum are going out like that, not just up like that along the jet. So um, I think I, I was told to finish at, at 7.45, which I think is, uh, I, I hope you'll make me an honorary German for showing my last slide at 7.45. Uh, I may not aspire to Swiss standards, but I think I've done pretty well. So at any rate, so my summary I put up here, the HT observations, they provide a, a magnificent affirmation, the black hole model of AGN are telling us much more besides. The standard interpretations, we observe a thick iron pressure supported, cold electron, cool but still radiating electrons in the accretion disk. And our alternative idea is we're actually observing a magnetosphere which is all electromagnetic field and so on around the spanning black hole. And the function of this is to essentially drive up all the gas that's supplied kindly by the cluster. And I didn't, didn't make a big point of it here, but um, it ought to be possible to distinguish these two interpretations observationally. 
And um, I, again, I haven't made this, but may come up in, in the questions. Um, this sort of general way of looking at black holes and indeed this, this and central, central gravitating objects has implications for other systems as well. So thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to uh, trying to address some of the questions I'm sure you may have. Thank you so much, Roger. That was a real interesting new view, I think, of, of, this, of these images. I certainly have not heard anything like this before, and I'm sure there are many questions. Uh, uh, Brian, go ahead. Um, so yeah, it was a fantastic talk, Roger, really interesting. Uh, it, so are you trying to argue that this magneto-ergosphere model is now, a, let's say, universal behavior? You think most AGN should be behaving like this? Uh, very, thank you, Brian. Uh, an e excellent question. Um, I, I, and the answer is no. Um, black holes, um, like babies, have to grow and they have to be fed. And a baby won't grow if he, if she or he uh, constantly spits up all the food, spits out all the food they're given. So um, we that that six six billion solar masses did not did not. I, I can't believe that happened from a single monolithic collapse. It was built up from gas and stars, perhaps, but particularly gas over its lifetime. And when you supply uh, the food at a, at a large rate, you, um, you're not sparing in your feeding of the black hole child, then um, you're in a different mode of accretion and it's much more conservative with respect to mass supply. And that's what matters. Whether or not you accept 10 to the 25 grams per second in M87 is neither here nor there in its overall weight gain. Um, but if, if you're in a regime which, is, you know, in the past, M87 would have been brighter than Virgo. So our common ancestors um, a billion or so years ago would have seen something uh, brighter, not, brighter than Vega, I meant to say, not Virgo, brighter than Vega, would have seen a star on the sky uh, that was M87, that was one of the brightest things on the sky. And that would have been in, in a sort of quasar-like mode and, um, and being supplied with... Um, uh, you know, two or three orders, four four orders of magnitude more mass than, than it's getting at the moment. Um, Christian. Yeah, hi, I had a, a question of the physical understanding of how the field lines connect to the black hole. I mean, you have raised this point quickly, but we have the, the uh, Noahair theorem, I mean, for vacuum black holes, but what happens to the field lines or to the magnetic field if it penetrates the horizon? What is your understanding, physical understanding of what's going on there? Um, let, 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 me, let me address your very good question a little didactically here, because I think there's a very important and relevant part of physics here. Um, and you say, quite right. I'm going to use, use this slide, but it, it actually an earlier one might be slightly more directly relevant, but let's use this slide. If I imagine a black hole in vacuum and I just allow some magnetic field to, um, uh, to penetrate the horizon, then uh, unless that black hole is, carries a heavy gravitational charge, and it can only do this in vacuum. So only in the sort of space of applied mathematics can it do this. Then it can have a dipole-like field which extends outside the horizon. If it's uncharged, which I, you know, you've got um, typically um, uh, zeta to yotta electric volt, volt potential differences there. That's ten to the twenty-one to ten to the twenty-four. Um, volts of potential difference then you only near, need a mere million volts of potential difference to create an electron positron pair so this you know the vacuum is a perfect conductor um, so under those circumstances the if you had a magnetic field threading the horizon and it's uncharged then the field goes away in a few dynamical times and that's that's essentially an expression of the no hair theorem however 
if you have gas orbiting the black hole, which contains currents outside the horizon, and the contention is that's what you have here on any of these interpretations, you have currents flowing in the, in the orbiting gas outside the black hole, you essentially have the magnetic field there that you're then putting a black hole inside it, that, black, that magnetic field will then thread the horizon, and it doesn't contradict the no-hair theorems, which are statements about black holes in vacuum. I can't see other questions from the floor at the moment. Um, maybe I can ask a question, uh, Roger. So referring to the fact that um, the black hole is, um, I mean, this, would you describe, I mean, the black hole is increasing mass during during these, these are things. It, it imports mass, but it also exports mass in the form of energy is I, I'm just trying to get in my head right the rate at which the black hole can increase its mass okay it, 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 during this phase that you're describing I, I uh, presume there are other phases where it does something different as you just alluded to yeah thanks Richard again for a lovely question because it's it, it sort of brings up a point I didn't have to have time to make um the what's what we contend is happening in M87 right now is that black hole is losing mass. It's not oh. gaining mass, it's losing mass. And it loses mass at the expense of its spin or rotational energy. The area of the event horizon, which is the thing that has to increase, is increasing, but it can increase and yet lose mass. So M87 in its cu current um, gas-starved um, phase is actually living off past, past uh, mass grown. It's like being put on a diet, if you like, and trying to lose weight. And so it is succeeding in losing weight. And it does this by spinning down. And the power that it releases goes primarily into the jets but perhaps 10% of it gets out into the accretion disk and drives away the gas. Now, if we look at your and Brian and my common ancestor a billion or so years ago, staring at the sky and seeing this bright objects in the direction of the Virgo um, constellation, that's one of the brightest things in the sky. Uh, that, that, is, that is when it got its mass gain. And it, maybe it started for 100 solar masses. Maybe it's my own view is it these black holes probably started at 10th, 5th or 10th, the 6th solar masses. And it did sort of happen more or less, more or less invisibly by some sort of on like, but, but it, no, sorry, they start this, sorry, let me back up a bit. It, it, it grew very rapidly, not in monolithic class, but it grew very rapidly about a million solar masses because you can essentially accrete um, at the Bondi radius in a radiation trap way. So you don't actually have to radiate up to about a million solar masses. But thereafter, it grew to its six billion solar mass uh, scale by more or less conservative gas accretion in, the, in, a, in a sort of quasar-like phase. And so when you look at the quasars, they're not expelling all the gas. They are actually conservative. Yeah. And there are analogs for binary X-ray sources. And even for protostellar this, you can cook up a sort of analog of this. Right. So, so, so this is what you mean by nature feedback being, you know, galaxy yes. feedback is a is a, nat, a nature pheno phenomenon, not a, not a nurture. Uh, right. Is, it, this is actually opposite so this, to what so most here, people here's the punchline. <laughs> Go on. Yeah. That, yeah. So this is yeah. the punchline. Yeah. Okay. I, I get it now. <laughs> um, that's that's intriguing because it, because in fact you know. Many people would say that, you know, um, in the nurture way, you know, the feedback is where the accretion, the gas accretion, gas is coming down and, and um, but it's clear that, as you said in your introduction for Virgo, feedback is going on now. Otherwise, as you said, the gas would be colliding with the galaxy without this going on. Yes, uh, um, 
in the more again the more extreme earlier versions of this notion which i think were applied mainly to the perseus cluster it was alleged that there was a thousand solar masses per year crashing into the per perseus cluster which has you know which is in complete violation of the observations and any understanding of what the galaxy did now that was that turned out to be somewhat exaggerated but it's a general phenomenon that there is feedback from the nucleus of the galaxy. There's other forms of feedback in galaxies inside clusters, uh, but probably I think most people think most of it comes from either the, <clears throat> the inner accretion disk through a wind or, or when it's present a jet. And jets are particularly good for getting energy from a region no bigger than the solar system out into the vast into the distant parts of the cluster because you want to you want to heat the gas at remotely and jets are a very good way of doing that yeah. and, this, and this is the way it it stops being quenched completely by the infalling gas okay that's really intriguing um are there any more questions from the floor during the during the formal part of the colloquium uh we will have another opportunity afterwards for more informal chats I don't see anything at the moment. So um, before we thank Roger, I'd like just like to make a, an announcement for next week's colloquium. And I'll just take back the screen temporarily. Please do. I'll stop sharing. Yeah. OK, I'll just do that now. Uh, oh, click the wrong button. There it is. Um, so next week, we'll, we'll be going on uh, having a talk by Andrea Miglio from the University of Bologna about what uh, astro seismology is telling us about the assembly history of the Milky Way as um, work in conjunction with um, other surveys like Gaia. So now, I'm coming back to today, I'd like to really thank Roger uh, for this talk and I invite everybody to um, open up their screens and their microphones and let's give Roger a great send off. Thank you very much, Roger.